bro. Welcome back, gamers. Oh, it's been a while. It is been a while. Let me curl up a little bit. Yep. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's been a while uh, since I've last streamed. Uh, it's been more than a month, I think. Yeah, sorry about that. I mean, starting a new job and all is kind of complicated. <laughs> also, it is not very conducive of me streaming like three times per week and in the middle of the afternoon. That is something you can do when you're fun employed, uh, like I was. Uh, or in some cases, I've seen... Um, people actually do streaming as part of their job. Um, since I have to work on stuff that is not entirely public, uh, I will not be able to stream that. Sorry about that. Oh. Yeah, in the meantime, I try to go through the, the backlog of votes that I have still to upload, so... I'll, I'll try to make up for that. <laughs> oh, Yeah, the return to streaming. Um, I'll probably try and stream during the weekends at this point, uh, mostly because I miss it. I really want to go back to stream, but also because um, it's, a, it's a good way to just take a break from work at this point. And the other thing that I kind of appreciate is that there is still a lot of stuff to be um, talking and working on in the GNOME project, so streaming is, is still kind of an interesting way to do this more in the open, uh, rather than just hacking and opening issues and merge requests. Uh, I still have to do... Uh, 1.0 release of Umbral, for instance. I have um, plans of doing another Cairo snapshot uh, on stream, so uh, you will see me um, hurting a lot <laughs> when it comes to releasing a complex project like Cairo. To be fair, I really want to land the um, Meson build instead of using the, the auto tools build, and that should simplify the release process by a lot. Uh, in any case, um, having to stream in the weekend and not during the week means that I get to stream less, but also I means that I have to plan more. Uh, planning more in terms of not just figuring out what to stream about in like the 15 minutes before pressing stream on OBS. So I'm I'm going to plan a little bit. And the plan for this stream is uh, to talk about introspection, GeoJ introspection. I ran a poll on Mastodon YouTube and Twitter and with the exception of Twitter which is I mean it's a weird platform at this point um, most people asked for a stream about GeoJ introspection and that means not just working on GeoJ introspection but also language bindings and things like that the yeah the, the Twitter the people that follow me on Twitter uh, voted to um, for me to write like, GTK uh, tutorials, which is still a thing. 
and I'll I'll do that. <laughs> I'll go back and do it now. I actually have been doing that uh, on and off for um, like I don't know every once in a while still. So I'm I'm still writing documentation, so don't worry about that. But I'll I'll try to do a stream about that. Hi Jeff, welcome. Um, but yeah, yeah, today uh, I'll I'll heed the um, the results of asking the the social uh, networks, uh, <laughs> and then I will try to uh, I will be talking about introspection, judge introspection. I tr tro K K S. Uh, oh, discovery Twitch from Aston. Thanks. Um, yeah, uh, um, Mastodon has been taking up <laughs> uh, a little bit of the uh, the slack in the um, in the social networks uh, as of late. So uh, I opened a GTK uh, Mastodon account so that people can follow uh, GTK development there as well. Um, I also managed the Twitter uh, GTK account, but that is a little bit more complicated um, because I only have it on my phone and not on my desktop um, for various reasons. <laughs> I, I try to minimize the amount of time I spend on social networks, especially Twitter. But yeah, if you want to follow um, GDK development on Mastodon, uh, you can go on floss.social uh, slash at GTK and you will get um, you will be able to follow uh, GTK news there. Um, I also started using a little bit more the This Week in GNOME the weekly roundup of happenings in the GNOME project and uh, I've started adding GTK news there as well, especially for like big line items like deprecations and things like that and new features so uh, we are trying to make more people aware of what's happening in the the platform at this point um people always complain that they they have no idea what's happening and i mean we try but <laughs> this is this is what we can do so Right, so let's get right into it because this is going to be a topic that is going to um, cover a lot of stuff there. Um, the it requires a little bit of like introspection as a topic is not just a project, so it's not just GeoJ introspection. There's a lot of stuff there. There's a lot of stuff because it's a very old topic um it goes way back at the very beginning of gtk so we're talking about late 90s um and it's an interesting topic not just because it touches a lot of the ways people consume the gnome platform as application developers but also because it impacts things like uh, new features that land in GNOME in the GNOME software development platform and impacts things like documentation, impacts things like um, various language bindings, uh, application development, and uh, in other cases can impact things like um, writing plugins for applications and, and things like that. So it's a, it's a fairly large topic. And as I said, it's an old one, even though the current incarnation is a little bit over, just over, a little bit over 10 years old, the actual, like, the way we, the, the it's not the, it's not the, it's just the current implementation. Before that, we had other implementations that cover more or less the same thing and they date uh, again late 90s so yeah let's talk a little bit about 
how we take what is essentially a C API and then we turn it into something that can be consumed by other languages or can be used to generate API references. And yeah, we can start from the very beginning. Uh, so GTK is a C API, right? It's a, it's a bunch of header files and a shared library. Uh, so the other files provide you with the, the API and the shared library provides you with the symbols that you can use. And it turns out that the, the C API is kind of a lie. It, it's a wide lie, but it's kind of a lie. It's not really an actual, the actual thing you can use, you can consume to write applications. Uh, you can write code for it. Um, and the reason why is that C doesn't tell you at all about things like, if I return you a pointer to some data, is that data going to be owned by you or is still going to be owned by the library that you, by the function that you called? Uh, if you pass a pointer to some data, to a function, will that function take it and copy it inside its own memory storage, or it will just assume that the memory that you, the pointer you passed will be valid. And if it assumes they will be valid, how long it will be valid? It will be valid until the next call or until something else happens. And that is, yeah, kind of the lie at the, at the very core of any attempt at using a C API. You cannot just read the other file and be done with it. Uh, it's not like, for instance, uh, in Python, it, everything is reference counted. Every object you pass is reference counted. So you, all, you always pass references around and if something owns, uh, if something takes ownership of that, it will take a reference and release it when it's done. And you don't have to care about that. The, the memory will be valid until something keeps a reference on it. And if nothing keeps a reference on it, it will be dropped on the floor and it will be collected by the garbage collector. Done, right? It's pretty easy. It's pretty simple. Uh, in Rust, you have uh, transfer, transfer semantics. So you can annotate, you can say this memory that I'm passing you is a reference or this memory that I pass you, I basically, the function will, will borrow it, will take it and then will take ownership of that by default. Otherwise it will take reference of it. And once the reference is done, it's done. Uh, the memory gets deallocated. And C++ has, uh, again, explicit move semantics. So you have std move and something like that. Um, other languages use reference, references, reference counting or garbage collection. That's fine. C doesn't have any of that. You pass memory around, the memory gets used. Yeah, doesn't get used. Uh, you leak. <laughs> it's fine. Uh, you access a dangling pointer. Oh, that, that's a segmentation fault. That's fine. Um, so the, the, the idea of a C API that it's only just the header files that you see is kind of a lie. It's, it's not enough. It's definitely not enough. Uh, you'll say, oh, you can pass a const pointer, right? And yeah, the const pointer is fine, but still doesn't tell you the, the semantics of that particular const pointer. So yeah, who gives a shit. Uh, and now everyone, everything can be constified. And to be fair, C's const operator is useless because it can be cast away. Like you can remove it <laughs> and you're done. So the compiler will not even, not even complain. So it's, yeah, it's, it's not enough. Either file is not enough. Uh, it's never been, it will never be enough. So every time you write like a C API, you're actually, 
you actually have to encode the behavior of the API somewhere. And that somewhere is usually a comment, uh, like a documentation block. Um, and it's going to be part of the API reference, which means you have to read the API reference. Haha, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> read the API reference. That, that's, that's a nice joke. Um, but of course, there are also conventions, um, like the entirety of GObject is a massive set of conventions. Um, if you pass an object around, then the object gets referenced by the by the CLI or by the color, and the reference will be acquired and released whenever necessary. So we get garbage collection in that way. Um, strings are usually passed and copied uh, into functions and when they were, whenever they return uh, if you don't return a const pointer then you get uh, a cop you get a copy of that um, so in general we have a bunch of conventions and libraries follow those conventions that is not nearly enough for like it's close, but it's not enough to still be able to like write libraries on top. Um, you basically you you really have to to define those conventions inside the documentation, and people have to read the documentation. Otherwise, it's completely useless. And as I said, this is very like human heavy. Uh, you need to have a human read the documentation and understand it in order to use it. But not everything is <sighs> interpreted by humans. In some cases, you have to have machines involved, like code generators, documentation generators, and things like that. So you need a way to describe a C ABI in a way that is machine readable, machine parsable, so that a program can read it, read the description and do something with it. Oh, hi, Martin. Ah, uh, yeah, docs, <laughs> yes. Everyone reads documentation. That's why every library has perfectly written documentation that everyone just knows how to read and follow and everything works fine and nobody writes bugs of course but yeah so if if we like remove humans from the loop and we keep machines in there writing the documentation is of course not gonna be enough it's not gonna be useful for machines machines don't read documentation humans barely do <laughs> Machines have no idea what the documentation even is. So, since the very beginning of GTK, we, well, I, I'm saying we, I wasn't working on GTK at the time, um, but the GTK, the people that worked on GTK had the problem of describing the API and the ABI of GTK and ancillary libraries in a way that was parsable by um, another program in order to do something. And that something usually meant generating code or um, being able to use the description, the API description uh, from other languages. Because we are in the worst timeline possible and C has become the lingua franca of the entirety of the uh, of like computers everywhere. Um, so the base operating system exposes a C API, and language uh, programming languages um, expose the uh, expose a way to deal with that, uh, deal with um, extension uh, to their native modules using uh, using C. Um, if they're not using C, they're using the C ABI, using the foreign 
um, function interface. So, again, we are in the worst timeline possible. I actually like the GTK MM docs, much better than the GTK ones. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm sorry that you feel that way. Uh, of course, I feel that GT the C documentation is pretty much better in every way possible um, since I wrote that. <laughs> uh, I understand that some people have problems with that, uh, especially people that are used to the old version of uh, the GTK doc, um, the GTK doc generated. Um, I mean, I don't know what to say. Most of the documentation generators these days were pretty much like the one I wrote. So, you know, it's it requires some recalibration. Uh, it's, I mean, I understand people that have problems with that. Uh, it's, yeah, we'll get to that because uh, introspection also impacts that particular um, side of things. So uh, we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Um, yeah. So at the very beginning, GTK um, needed a way to expose the API in a machine readable way. And there were different approaches there. One of them was uh, expose the, the API as a bunch of uh, S expressions, which are kind of a Lisp dialect, um, because that's, that's an easy grammar to parse. Um, there was XML, there was a bunch of other things. And a bunch of language bindings use that kind of approach. Each one had their own silo. Um, so the C++ bindings used uh, S expressions um, and a similar way was used by the Python bindings. Uh, the Perl bindings never used that because Python, uh, sorry, Perl has a different way to deal with that and can literally just um, use the, the excess format which is a kind of a C and you just need to basically copy and paste the, the C API into that particular one. And Perl will generate the trampolines for you and, and things like that. It's pretty, it's pretty neat, but it didn't require an external way of defining the C API or ABI. Um, but yeah, every single language has its own silo, has its own like format to describe it, to describe the C API and generate code from it or so on and so forth. And by the uh, by the time we were close to GNOME 3.0 or we were like planning GNOME 3.0, the, the main problem was finding more people to work on language bindings. Uh, language bindings have always been uh, kind of problematic because they require you to know the language, know the low-level C API, and know the the uh, the the bits of the language and the library that interface within each other. And the the Venn diagram of people knowing all of them is as a very very small intersection. Um, and instead, you want to be able to write, like, to make the the API more like Pythonic or more JavaScripty or more I don't know Perlish, um, by writing native code instead of writing C code or C or weirdo C code. Um, so the end result is that a bunch of people get got together and thought about how to make this. Um, make a single description of the API. So the logic to describe the API would stay close to the API instead of being separated in every single silo. And then every single language would use the same source uh, of truth for the, the description of the API. And the overall idea was this will reduce the amount of people that the reduce the amount of knowledge needed to build the language bindings and free up more resources for people to write wrappers on top of it 
on top of it so that the um the api would be uh, better usable by in other languages and to a certain extent that worked to other extents that was uh, kind of a failure uh, because it's a complicated topic there <laughs> um but yeah the this is how GeoBJ introspection came to be. It was an attempt at getting all the little silos for every single language that had bindings for GTK to share the logic when it comes to um, interface with a low-level C API. So uh, take the C API, describe it in a way that is neutral and is as detailed as possible. And then from then on, uh, create a way for dynamic languages, for instance, to call directly, uh, load symbols from the share library and call them, uh, prepare all the arguments, prepare all the uh, wrapper values for like, um, like parameters for a function and return values, uh, deal with signals, uh, deal with type hierarchies and things like that. And for code generators, like for the Rust bindings or for like C++, even though C++ doesn't use introspection, um, the idea was to be able to have enough information to generate the trampolines out of that um, API description without having to write manual code or ad hoc code. And that is, that is the goal of GeoJ introspection. So the important thing to understand though, is that, as I said, every C API is not just a header file or a bunch of header files and a shared library is, uh, a set of conventions and a set of very specific patterns that a library has to maintain or multiple libraries have to maintain across the the spectrum there which means that when i talk about introspection i'm talking specifically about geobja introspection uh it's not called random c library introspection it's called geobja introspection which means that it depends very heavily on G object on CG object. Uh, patterns, uh, mechanics of how the type system is implemented, uh, the, the structure of the, 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 um, uh, the complex data types, uh, the, uh, the things like properties, things like that. And also depends on the type system. So you have to understand how the type system is actually implemented, how to ask the type system at runtime and things like that. So again, it's G object introspection. It is fundamentally that it cannot, it can be used to parse stuff that is not strictly speaking based on G object, but there will be friction there. Uh, and in some cases that friction is the difference between a usable library and a completely unusable mess. Like, the only time we get in Python is when you start using Cairo, it's pretend manual introspection, which can leave memory dangling. Yeah, that is a case. Cairo is not a G object based library. The only reason why there is a, an introspection module for Cairo is just because you need it in order to be able to describe the API provided by GTK because GTK exposes some Cairo, some Cairo types. So in order to generate the introspection data for GTK, you have to have the introspection data for Cairo available. And that means having a shim there, but there is no Cairo introspection. Uh, there is no uh, job introspection for, for Cairo. Um, you cannot use it. <laughs> you cannot, you cannot use anything like that. You have to use the native Cairo binding for Python or Rust or whatever, or JavaScript. Uh, there, there is no automated way. There is no dynamic way to deal with that. Um, Cairo is its own type system, as its own type system, and it works in a very different way from from G object. 
because it sits at a lower layer than than GeoJet. It sits even a lower layer of G well, it doesn't sit at the lower level layer than Glib, sadly. But yeah, it cannot be used like that. Hi, Mirko. Welcome. And yeah, basically, as I was saying, the introspection part is very much tied to the G object part. So it's not something that you can separate adequately. Um, you, if you have a G object library, you can use G object introspection. If you don't have a G object library, Within reason, you can expose some stuff through GeoJ introspection, but in many cases, you will not be able to get a proper API unless you restrict your your API in ways that are not entirely. Um, sometimes they're not entirely ergonomic. Hi, Fry Tape. Uh, is it possible to create introspection stuff from Rust without writing C API? Uh, I think somebody was working on that. Um, so you can have. You don't necessarily need to generate the C header or C symbols, but you still need to expose a C ABI. Uh, again, Geometry introspection is a way to describe a CABI for other people to consume. So the overall idea is that the uh, you still need to expose a CABI for other people to consume. So the open the, the share library and then call into it. And you cannot just generate a bunch of XML and be done with it. So. Uh, I think we'll we'll go, we're gonna get into what the structure is in a little bit in a, just a little bit uh, when I open up the GeoJ introspection repository and we go through it and I explain how the various parts are put together. But the overall idea is that even if you have a Rust library uh, and you have um, uh, if you have a Rust library, you still have to expose a C ABI for other people to consume. Otherwise, it will be pointless. At that point, generating uh, a C header file is, or writing a C header file, isn't the worst crime of all. Um, I know that LibreSVG, for instance, as a, a C header file is completely, like, it's a, a, a just a set of declarations, and the definitions are all inside the, the Rust library. And the object, the object introspection for LibreSVG uses the C header as the source and the symbols are there and that's it. Nothing else. Um hi muffin topper, I don't have regrets, sorry. <laughs> um but yeah, so this is kind of an a like a ten thousand feet overview of what G object uh introspection is and a little bit of it, its history. Um, let's see. I'll take a little bit. Okay. I'm going to open this off stream. Well, not appropriate, not really off stream, but uh, where are you? Geometry introspection. There you go. Uh, I wish the Rust bindings will create the C API automatically. It kind of sucks to write C API manually. Yeah. I mean, there are some experiments in that direction. The overall idea is being able to uh, write the G object like code in Rust and then have the macros generate the shims for, for you. And then you just need to document them so that you can run um you can extract them into uh, i don't know a separate file a separate c file that that you can parse with gobj introspection or have another um introspection data generator 
that generates the 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 XML and the type lib file for you, um, and so on and so forth. It's complicated. Uh, it all this stuff is usually uh, in band inside compilers, um, but in this case, we are basically taking a description of the API that is larger. It's a superset of the actual CABI. And that means having external tools dealing with that. And the external tool that we have right now is a complex set of machinery. Um, you could take the same machinery and re-implement it in another way that gets called by, I don't know, the Rust compiler or by Cargo and generates all the data for you. But the end result is still being able to describe a C ABI. So at that point, might as well have some code that generates the C ABI for you or the C API for you that you can parse and describe using uh, the mechanisms of GeoJ introspection. Uh, speaking of GeoJ introspection, let's go on my desktop and we're going to see the GeoJ introspection repository. So, the, the way GeoJ introspection is written is kind of weird. And it's I, I'm going to come out and say it. it's not the greatest way possible to deal with this um, because it has to do things that aren't very nice to see. So first of all, you cannot parse C. Um, you cannot write a, a parser for C. It's it's pointless. You, you, you shouldn't even attempt it. It's basically impossible. Um, C cannot be parsed by anything that is in the compiler. Um, if you find a C parser and people tell you, yeah, yeah it's it's a C parser. It's, it's a it's a perfectly spec. Uh, um, it's 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 a complete and and spec valid C parser. They're lying um, because you need a compiler. Most of the time, uh, most of the C spec is basically based on the assumption that your it a compiler is going to work on the other side of things because it has to deal with architecture. It has to deal with some compiler decisions, uh, platforms, things like the the uh, the the triples for determining the architecture. Um, some stuff gets resolved only on a specific architecture. So you cannot literally just take code that has been compiled by a compiler on a platform and run it on another platform. Uh, you cannot even like assume that two compilers on the same platform will generate the exact same code, um, like on an ABI compatible level. <laughs> it's no, it's, it doesn't happen. It doesn't work that way. And in that sense, the, the parser that is at the basis of GeoJ introspection is, yes, a simple grammar that describes C and turns it into something that can be tokenized and read and can be assumed to be a, a declaration parser. But in practice, it's taking a lot of liberties with the entirety of the code that it's scanning. So it's not, I mean, you cannot assume that anything that geometry introspection generates is going to be C that uh, can be used to basically just call into C with no problems whatsoever and it will work on any platform. It's also the reason why you cannot cross compile GeoJ introspection because it doesn't work that way and it cannot be made to work. The only way to make this work would be for each compiler 
to like each C compiler to generate the introspection data by itself from its own AST and have this integrated with the compiler. You cannot do it from the outside and still be compatible with every single C um, in exist C compiler in existence or any platform in existence. Um, I mean, we don't particularly care. Um, G object is based on a variety of assumptions that in some cases are complete undefined behaviors uh, according to the C specification. Um, we only know that G object works on MSVC, GCC, CLang. Those are the three main compilers that we know it works. And we know it works on Linux, most of it, yeah. On Linux, uh, on the GNU libc, probably work on Muzzle. Um, it kind of works on Bionic. Um, it works on x86-64, x86, and ARM, um, some ARM. <laughs> architectures uh, so in practice we have a very limited subset of we what we can a limited subset of platforms architectures compilers and anything and that kind of limited subset is also where we guarantee that job introspection works uh, if you move outside of that subset you're on your own uh, we the compiler will not save you, the platform will not save you, the C spec will not save you, so might as well. But yeah, the only way to make it work would be to literally take the entire thing, move it into GCC or into CLang or into MSVC. Uh, good luck with that, by the way. And then have the compiler do this work for you. Of course, that will not happen. <laughs> like ever it will not happen so yeah uh, we might as well rewrite the entirety of the gnome platform in i don't know rust uh which is not gonna happen anyway but the idea of moving job introspection into the c compiler it would be like moving G object into the C compiler and have the C compiler deal with all the reference uh, acquisition and release, for instance, or the signal emission uh, boxing and unboxing for you. And that is not going to happen. Sorry. <laughs> we all... It, it, we can't always get what we want. And since this is a, is a library, it's not even Vala. I mean, not even Vala deals with that. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it's, it's, yeah, it's not going to happen anyway. So what we have right now is the closest thing that we can get to a reasonable set of assumption. Um, so... The way GeoG introspection works is this. You have a, a set of like header files and C files. It doesn't require the implementation. It only requires the declarations. Um, so you have a, a bunch of header files with a bunch of declarations and you have um, a bunch of files that contain the document, the doc blocks for the um, those symbols. And then we run the introspection scanner on it. The introspection scanner is kind of an interesting piece of machinery. It is um, a parser, a C parser that knows, that understands how C is declared, the, the C declarations. Uh, let me see if I can, yeah. So it's Alexa. Uh, it's using Flex and Bison, so it's nothing super, super complicated. It's actually fairly, uh, fairly basic. But yeah, basically you have a description of a bunch of symbols there. 
and then you have a grammar uh, let me see this is the the lexer and there should be a parser there where are you parser Yeah. There you go. That's our scanner. There you go. Yeah. It's a simple like parser uh, using flex and bison that takes the 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 declarations in C and then generates a bunch of tokens that um, can be built into an abstract syntax tree of tokens. And then you have a massive Python thing that just takes that and turns it into XML. So you have a bunch of types in Python that describe like fundamental types and other C type names. And then all the all the rest of the structures there. And the the overall idea is that you take the C declarations, you parse them in a way that's kind of understandable, and then you also parse the documentation there because the documentation contains the way to override what the C declaration doesn't say or says, but it's not enough. Uh, for instance, this void star pointer is actually an out argument for uh, an integer, let's say, or an enumeration. Uh, or, um, I don't know, this array is, uh, this uh, char star star array is actually an array of uh, UTF-8 strings and it's null terminated. So there will be, the last element is null. Or let's say this argument that is an int star is actually an out argument. So the direction of the argument is from, goes from the function to the, the, the scope that called the function. Uh, or this, uh, I don't know, this, uh, um, this enumeration type is actually an in out. So it, uh, the function gets called with a value pointing to a value, and then the function will change the value, um, and return it. And so all this information, all this, like, uh, description of the API goes not in the C declaration because it's impossible to do that with the, the C grammar but it goes into a bunch of documentation. So you have doc blocks and those doc blocks have the name of the arguments or they have like return value or returns or um, the, and then have a bunch of custom annotations. So this, uh, the ownership of this data that you passed is returned to you in full, or it's, uh, just a pointer to some data that you don't own. So you don't have to, you cannot modify it. You should not free it. Uh, you mustn't free it and, and so on and so forth. All that metadata, all the information that is the description of the API, the actual functionality of the API is done on top of the C declaration. And that means having a bunch of parsers that run on that, um, that very basic C uh, declaration parser and parse the documentation blocks and understand the annotations that are there. And once you have them, you can generate a more complex abstract syntax tree. And from that abstract syntax tree, then you can take it and generate a bunch of XML. Because of course, you have a tree, what are you gonna do? 
you're gonna use XML. Um, it's it's verbose enough, and people know how to write parsers for XML. And the end result is this massive XML data file that contains the description of the API. Let me see. Uh, Let's see here. Uh, um, let's configure the project. Current configuration is not the default. Okay, building. Okay. Not the host. And we use the GNOME toolbox. And there we go. Okay, let's see. Hi, Johan. You probably have used JSON, but the XML hype was not 100% over when the format was decided in 2006, 2007. Uh, that is true. Uh, honestly, I would not ever use JSON for anything um, in general. JSON is a very bad format. Um, I mean, I'd be scared to write a parser for this format, for the introspection format using J um, using JSON. Um, yeah, I mean, there aren't many uh, there aren't many textual formats for this kind of data. Um, I, I'd still probably choose XML to this day. Um, using JSON would be weird, mostly because it's there's a lot of, of information there. They uh, they it requires like proper descriptions. It has to be descriptive. One of the things that I kind of don't like about the use of XML is that. It's more to the fact that the information is incomplete in some cases, but it's just the parser in that case, just the generator there. It's not the actual format. Um, JSON is easy to consume. That is true. That is actually true. Um, yeah, the parser will still be a mess. It will also probably be easier to compress. To be far, to be fair, uh, the GTK, like, not even the GTK. Let's see. Yeah, the description for the GIO API is nearly six megabytes, but it also includes documentation. So. But it's pretty big, and GTK is even bigger. Uh, you know, 1.0. I yeah, I'm inside. Um, I have to get into toolbox. Yeah, 
Yeah, GTK 7.5 megs. So it's it's big. It's really big. But yeah, in general is it's kind of an it's kind of a trade-off. I I understand the the, the trade-off made at the time was pretty understandable. Um XML is still a widely used format. And yeah. The XML parser are parser are pretty good anyway. And most of the, the parsers that we have for the XML So you either have a parser for the XML in your native language or you're using some C parser anyway. Um like I, I had to write an XM, uh, an introspection metadata parser in Python. It's not great, but it's the, you you get the elementary API, the API out of out, right out of the um, Python standard library. Uh, Rust probably has more problems with that because uh, Rust doesn't have a decent XML parser. I mean, it has XML parsers, but. It it would probably be, be it would probably be easier to have a very simple like JSON um, serializer and deserializer uh, using serve the JSON and then just define the data structures and then bump them into it, bump the the JSON into them. I don't know. Um, at some point we'll have to figure, and this is a topic for future streams or or whatever, but. At some point, we'll have to move all this stuff into Glib, uh, which means dealing with all this crap, like generating the XML, generating the, the generating the introspection data, generating the introspection binary blob, parsing it, and and so on and so forth. It's gonna be fun. So maybe when we move all this stuff into Glib, uh, we are gonna have to reconsider the choice of XML and move to another format. Who knows? But yeah, the, the entire thing here is not super, super complicated. It's just structured a little bit weirdly. And also it's structured in a way that requires Geometry introspection to be considered as a compiler, as part of your tool chain. So it cannot be something that exists in um, as a library, as an outside component. It is as central to your tool chain as your C compiler, as your uh, C standard library. So you have to have native builds of this. You have to have native version of everything that parses this stuff and this is necessary because if you have seen my gobject deep dive um uh, set of videos uh if you haven't uh i will probably put a link somewhere here in the uh, i don't know maybe here i don't know here uh when i upload this forward to YouTube. Um, but yeah, the the main problem of GeoJ introspection, as I said, is that a bunch of this stuff is not part of C. It's has to be, it's augmented. It's part of something on top of C. And when you have a, a runtime type system uh, with a bunch of runtime uh, additional functionality, like geobject properties and geobject sig signals the end result is that you cannot extract that information unless ju just from the header files you have or from uh the the c the, the documentation uh, attached to the c declarations you have to query the type system at runtime which means you have to generate a little bit of code and then compile it on your platform and then run it and then get the output of that and then 
put the output inside the introspection data. And this is why Jupyter introspection cannot be cross compiled. It's because and not even the, the, the library itself, you cannot cross compile the, the, the act of extracting the uh, information about the library that you're introspecting. You have to run, you have to compile and run a small binary on your target platform while cross compiling, which is, well, it can be done, of course, but you basically have to wrap the operation of running this stuff into uh, an helper like binary that runs natively, for instance. In some cases, you can do it with the QMU uh, static builds that basically just create a, a small virtual machine that runs the code uh, and then spits out other information on the other hand, on the other end of the, the stream. So this is why it cannot be cross compiled. Uh, a lot of people have asked over the years, I want to be able to cross compile my library, but GeoBridge Introspection makes it impossible. And how do I do it? How, how can I make it work? How can I, I can, I can fix GeoBridge Introspection so I can cross compile stuff. And the answer is you can't, it's just, it is not possible um, because most of the information that is attached to a G object that is not the simplest uh, uh, C declaration uh, and documentation blocks, um, like properties and signals and the type hierarchy and the uh, interfaces that have been uh, implemented by this type and so on and so forth do not exist at the C level. They only exist at runtime and that's it. Um, so as long as we have a runtime based type system, you get to have runtime based extensions to it and you get to have introspection that is based on runtime execution, which means you cannot do it cross compiling, um, natively you have to wrap your cross compilation effort using native execution, ex, uh, native executables. And yeah, sadly, this is how it is and can be done in any, any other way. But after you pass that particular hurdle, um, everything else is pretty much okay <laughs> um, because after you generated the XML out of the um, introspection metadata that we build, then we take that XML, um, we parse it again because of course we do, and we generate a bunch of C data structures. Let me see. Uh, where are you? We generate a bunch of data structures here that are essentially just binary blobs that have um, that describe the the types. Um, like, let me see like an argument, for instance, an argument for a callable. Um, you have the uh, the direction, whether it's in or out, whether the color of the, the uh, function uh, allocates the argument or not, whether it's nullable or optional, um, the ownership transfer, uh, the re if, if it's a return value, because arguments are, the return, return values are just arguments. Um, at the introspection level, uh, the scope of the memory, uh, sorry, the scope of the argument. So if the argument is valid for the entirety of the duration of the function, or if it's valid until another function gets called, or if it's valid until an asynchronous operation uh, completes and so on and so forth. 
again, this is a simple binary blob here. This is a, a signature for a, a callable. Uh, where is it? This is a symbol for a function. And again, it's all a bunch of like bit fields and so on and so forth. It's just a simple C structure um, because these structures get filled with the metadata that is inside the XML file. And then we take the memory that the memory area of these uh, blobs uh, there is there are generated from the XML and we just dump them into a file on your on your file system and this is called a type lib the reason why we do this it should be kind of obvious but parsing 7.5 megabytes of XML just for GTK is not a good plan if you want to start your application like your python application or javascript application like in a sensible amount of time um because you cannot just parse to gtk like xml you also have to parse all its dependencies so you have to parse gtk you also have to parse g object you have to parse gio pango um the cairo stubs uh, and a bunch of other things there so it's a lot of metadata. Uh, I think with all the dependencies, we are in excess of 20, 25 megabytes of XML, probably more. Uh, and I'm not even considering like libadwaita or libsoup. So if you have an application and you want to do something serious with it, you will have a bunch of libraries and most of them will have a fairly sizable um, API footprint. And that API footprint is reflected in the XML. So to avoid that, we have a very simple way of describing this stuff, like like flat structure, flat a bunch of binary blobs that can be mmapped. Uh, so you can ask the kernel just load a bunch of these files and then give me a file descriptor to them. And it's a lot easier, lots faster. Uh, and if something changes on the file system while the application is running the kernel will know it and will uh, either like notify you or the file will stay open and you will be able to read it but most importantly if a bunch of applications are using the same libraries the same uh, type lib information same binary blob uh, and all of them ask the kernel to open that particular file um, the kernel will just give you the file descriptor for that particular file it has already allocated so the end result is that everyone uh opens the exact same blob inside the um inside the the, the kernel the linux kernel so it's much more efficient it's super fast because again it's a bunch of c data structures that have been dumped into the into a file which means that you just read it back as is and you get the exact same data structures that were put there of course again you have to use this on the same platform and the same compiler uh, or at the very least the same c platform that compiled the job introspection data because of course the compiler decides how the structures are allocated, how the structures are laid out, which means that if you do this with one compiler and you try to load it like with another, then uh, 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 with a linker and load it with another, you get undefined behavior because that's how it is. Yeah, you can also see that, for instance, uh, all the strings, like all the, the labels and all the strings that are inside it, they are they exist in a separate table and you get uh, an offset inside the table instead of having a const char name here. Um, the name is a is a is the actual name. So instead of having 
uh, duplicates inside it, you get the same, you get an offset inside a table. There are, this is another way to save space, for instance, and it's another way to um, save time. There are ways of basically just re-implementing a bunch of stuff that is kind of elf. Um, so essentially you get like more efficient reads. Um, but yeah, the, the overall design of the introspection like library is not bad at all. It's fairly efficient. It's fairly well done um, considering that is in some cases a uh, um, like compromise between the reality of you cannot parse C <laughs> without a C compiler and the reality of uh, all of this stuff is platform dependent. So you cannot just invent your own uh, platform independent way of describing this stuff. But yeah, it's if if you want to understand how to serialize data and deserialize it efficiently, um, this library, Job Joint Inspection, is kind of a good case study for you. So if you want to understand how to deal with like saving information uh, in a way that is efficient for to be like you reused by multiple processes. Um, this is a fairly good example. I, I would strongly recommend people like read this code. Um, they would, you, you would probably learn a lot of things there. Uh, it's a, a teachable, <laughs> it's a teachable moment here. Um, but yeah, if you want to understand how to describe an API, this is a, this is a fairly good way of doing this. Of course, it could be better because everything could be better, but it, there is a reason why job during suspension has lasted more than 10 years. Um, there is a reason why all new language bindings use it uh, instead of using like ad hoc stuff. Uh, there is a reason why every time somebody comes along on the GTK, IRC or matrix channels and say, oh, I'm writing a new language binding. And uh, the first question is, are you using introspection data? And if the answer is no, then the the next question, the next sentence is going to be, please go and use introspe the introspection data. You, you're gonna you're gonna thank us, and you're also gonna save a lot of time. I've seen people that still parse. C header files like with their own like parser and it's like what what are you doing man? You're just hurting yourself. Why why are you doing this? Uh okay, so I have a bunch of stuff there that is kind of weird. Hmm, this is weird. I probably had something open um, ages ago and I had to reboot. Weird. Anyway, so uh, let me see. Oh, uh, yeah. Right. Yeah, this is a good this is a good place to to just explain this. So one of the things that is kind of problematic of GeoBJ introspection is this. Um GeoBJ introspection is written using glib and GeoBJ. Um because writing a C library 
without using glib is kind of pointless. And writing a C library without using a C library that relates to gobject without using gobject is also kind of pointless. The problem is gobject and GIO and glib expose a C ABI that is usually consumed by language bindings. So how is glib at gobject and GIO going to generate the introspection data if the introspection parser is not inside Glib? And the answer is they don't. It's always GeoBJet introspection that generates the, the introspection information for Glib. And the way it's done is horrific. Uh, essentially, what it does is it takes um it takes all the documentation stanzas uh, like all the doc blocks out of the source code in glib and dumps them into a bunch of files uh, gio 2.0c glib 2.0c and gmodule 2.0c uh g object wasn't changed so there is no g there is a g object 2.0c but it's not visible there uh yeah, you can see it here. And all these files are, it, it's just a file, a comment file, <laughs> a file with a bunch of comments. Uh, yeah, that's it. And then GeoBridge Introspection will read the header files of the installed copy of glib and we'll match it with the comments here to generate the introspection data for glib, gobject, gio, and gmodule. And then it will install it. So every time you change something, so let's assume you are a language binding developer and you find a bug inside GIO, for instance. So there is a, an annotation that is wrong or whatever. And then we take that and you say, okay, I'm going to fix the annotation inside GIO and it's going to be fine, right? Uh, you do that, gets merged, and the introspection data doesn't change. That's because then you have to go inside GeoBJ introspection, run a script that will scrape the dot blocks out of the uh, installed or out of the source code for glib or gio in this case and then generate regenerate the c file and then rebuild it and that will rebuild the introspection data again it's horrific but I, it's a compromise it's how we can actually make this work the other option would be to have GeoBridge introspection inside Glib so that you build Glib and then you run GeoBridge introspection and you will build the introspection data out of Glib. It's not trivial. Let's just say that it's kind of complicated. Um, there are a bunch of dependencies in play. especially on Python modules. Um, Jeopardy introspection includes like documentation generators as well, because of course it does. Um, so there is a lot of stuff that prevents this from happening as easily as it should. But I still live in hope. <laughs> I, I honestly want to take some time and be able to include an introspection generator inside Glib um, in the near future. Because this situation is kind of untenable now. Uh, it's, it's really hard. Also because, yeah, we want to be able to generate documentation out of the introspection data for Glib and GeoBJ and GIO. Uh, and that means 
being able to generate the introspection data for those projects. Otherwise, we would have a weird multiple cyclical dependency where you have to build glib without the documentation, then you have to build job introspection uh, with an update version of glib, and then you have to run the introspection scanner so that you can generate the documentation for glib in by rebuilding glib. Um, and yeah, that's not gonna happen. So, it, yeah, it's complicated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, let's see. Right. Uh, switch. Ah. I frankly hate the There we go. All right. So this is a thing that I've done uh, a few a couple of weeks ago. When was that? Yeah. Like end of October. It's something that I want to add to the introspection scanner for this cycle. So I'll, I'll probably land it pretty soon. I just need to rebase a couple of things there. Uh, but basically, if you have a, a type, if you have a, a G object type, then you know how to acquire and release a reference to it. Uh, G object ref and G object unref. It's part of the API, it's part of the type itself. Uh, if you know how to handle a G object, then you have to know how to handle acquiring and releasing reference. Uh, if you have a G type instance, which is the low level derivable type uh, from which every single derivable type in G object like, uh, stems from, so it's the very root of our type hierarchy then you need additional annotations to the introspection information to say uh, if you want to take a reference call this function if you want to reuse a reference take this function call this function if you want to assign this value this uh, uh, an instance to a g value call this function if you want to uh, retrieve an instance out of a g value this is the function you have to call and that is done using a bunch of um, annotations that we can see here. Where are you? There you go. Uh, 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 where are you? Yeah, here. So yeah, you have an annotation called reffunc, uh, annotation called unrefunc, and you have a annotation called get value func and set value func. And this works for like instance types. Um, but it doesn't we don't have anything for um, what introspection calls records, so structure types like structs and unions. Um, those usually in G in many G object based um, uh, many G object based libraries are matched by a G type a box G type. So a, a box G type is just a way to tell the type system, hey, um, this like struct, this plain old data cont data type. Um, can be copied and freed. And if you want to copy it, you call gbox copy. And if you want to free it, call gbox free. And it's fine and dandy for most of the language bindings, for instance. Um, it's perfectly fine. Um, you internally, they know how to handle um, box types because, of course, they have to. Otherwise, they would be very poor language bindings. Um, 
but it's kind of not enough for things like documentation generators. Um, because, of course, if you have, I don't know, um, a GTK allocation, which is a structure type that only contains like the width and height and uh, and X and Y coordinates of a widget. And it has uh, uh, a G type, it's a box type, so you get a G box copy and G box free, that's fine. But if you are a C developer, you're not going to be calling G box copy and G box free. Um, that would be absolutely pointless. And yeah, what would be the purpose of that? And that is even more like important for other like complex data types that are usually they are boxed, but so they are not a, a G object or a G type instance, but you're still supposed to allocate them and free them or copy them. And for that, I decided to add uh, a copy function and a free function annotation. So you can say this plain old data type as a copy function, that is this function here, and as a free function, that is it's uh, this free function here. And this can be used by documentation generators to uh, automatically generate a bunch of like a blurb saying, um, for instance, this function returns a newly allocated foo star. Um, how do I free it? So the documentation generators right now can say the ownership is yours. The ownership of the return data is yours. Uh, but right now they cannot say call like foo free to release the memory associated with it, uh, release the resources associated with it. Uh, you the, the library developer has to manually write that information. And that is bad. That is bad because most language bindings will reuse the same documentation from the introspection data. So a C developer is perfectly fine with uh, reading return value, a newly allocated foo, use foo free to uh, release the memory associated with it. But imagine a Python developer that gets that. What the heck? They have no idea what it, what that means. They they Python doesn't even expose foo free, for instance. Um, so why should they be calling it? Um, what's the purpose of that? The return, like the documentation for the return value, should be a new foo, and that's it. And then you have an annotation saying the transfer is full, which means the memory returned to you, the instance returned to you, is. Uh, now fully owned by you. And then if the type like foo has a notation that says free function is foo free, then the documentation generator can say, okay, if you want to free the data, the resources associated with foo, then you call foo free. And that's, that's it. The documentation generator can generate most of this stuff for you because if there is one thing that I know for certain on people on like library developers writing the documentation is that the less you make them write, the happier they are. Um, document the library developers and general programmers are not very good at document at writing documentation. Um, that's why like figures like uh, a technical writer exist. Uh, in this world. Um, that's why it's usually easier for somebody to read the API and then write the documentation than it is for people that are actually writing the API to also write the documentation. Uh, this is an experience. <sighs> it's a hard, hard one experience. Uh, it's really hard to convince people to actually write decent documentation. And especially if you start, if you ask them to write consistent documentation. Um, it's really hard. People like in, in a free software project, like multiple with multiple people working, um, it's already hard to get 
everyone to conform to the same existing coding style without any tool, um, like without any additional tool working for them, like um, code linters and code reformatting in place. Um, that is already hard. Writing consistent documentation is basically impossible without somebody that takes ownership of being the documentation editor. Um, somebody that literally just reads the entire documentation and changes it so it follows a singular voice, follows a, a specific set of rules. And the easiest way of simplifying this stuff is let the programmers writing the library just write the code and the basic description of the entire thing and then anything that can be automated should be automated anything that can be code generated i think it'd be generated by a machine should be generated by a machine and this means also this stuff here like how to free uh, an allocated variable or how to free um how to copy uh, uh how to make a copy of of a value here um which is also one of the reasons why people have troubles with the new uh, api reference c api reference for gtk it's because it's a lot more verbose than it used to be um it's because it's generating a lot more information out of it. So you don't have to write it. <laughs> and I know that people that are experienced with the C, the, the previous C API, the previous C reference, um, like they don't want to have all the information there because it's a lot and oh my God, it will take me ages to scan visually for stuff. But I can guarantee you that most of the people that are using an API reference are newcomers or people that are not very used to the API. And they really need everything spelled out for them. They cannot rely on existing patterns. They cannot rely on existing knowledge uh, because if they could do that, they would not be newcomers. Uh, shockingly enough. Um, people that don't know uh, what a platform does or what a library does um, don't know how to deal with it unless somebody explains it to them. I know, I know, it's it's weird, um, but yeah. So this is this inform this new annotation, the copy funk and free funk are there mostly because of that and. Um, it's kind of, mm. it how it also has a, a separate utility, uh, because it's kind of better to deal with that. Um, so if you use a box type, um, and you call G box copy or G box free, uh, you are basically calling a function that has to do a type check on data and then look into the type system, find uh, the definition of the type, the type meta information, and then find the function pointers for copy and free, and then jump into those function pointers and call them. There's a, a bunch of indirections there. And if you're using language binding, you are already doing that in order to get to gbox copy and gbox free. Um, which is, you know, fine. Um, if your language is not like super fast, it's not a huge deal. Um, but it's it's still time spent doing something that you could possibly avoid. I mean, I understand that generic code is usually better, but um, sometimes you don't really need that. And also, not every single um, plain old data type is a box type, is exposed to a box type. Uh, the only reason why people use a box type for like a, a simple C structure is because they are planning to use it as an argument inside a signal 
or as a value inside a, a geometry property. If you don't need either of those, then there is no actual need to expose that like plain old data type as a G as a box type, right? In many cases, you want that data type to be on the stack, for instance, instead of being on the uh, on the heap. Um, the so a language binding doesn't necessarily have to deal with that as a box type, but the problem is how does it know how to free the data or how to copy the data uh, if it's not a box type? Right now, language bindings kind of assume they can call uh, like gmalloc and gfree because it's a fair assumption. Um, but then they have to call that on all the elements uh, recursively and that, is, that can be very complicated and at which point people just use a box type for that but strictly speaking is not necessary it's not like it's not a requirement there's nothing inside geometry introspection that says you must use a box type otherwise you won't be able to use this from a language binding uh, it's a plain structure type you can use it so these new annotations here are also useful if you want to like deallocate stuff yourself uh, from a language binding because then you can just get the function uh, and invoke it directly uh, just like any other function inside uh, your language binding that's pretty much it so let me see and we Okay, this is the test, and this is the implementation. So every time you want to add an annotation to GeoJ introspection, um, well, the answer, every time you want to do that, just take a step back and think about, think about it. Uh, it's not because it's complicated or it's because it the process is Byzantine. Um, both of these statements are actually true, but it, it doesn't take long to, to understand how it's done. Um, it's mainly because you don't want to have too many annotations. Like adding annotation to a doc block is cognitive surplus. It's, it's a cognitive load uh on the library developer or the people that are actually writing the documentation so always think about it like multiple times hmm. the fuck hmm. yeah. cat hair jesus um too many cats um but yeah the the overall idea is that it's Again, not super complicated, but it's done in multiple places and you have to be aware of them, of all of them. And in some cases, you might want to just add an annotation for the XML introspection data um, because that's all that it's important. Uh, in some cases, you want to add the uh, annotation so that it's also available for people using the um, binary blob and adding annotation for the XML is probably pretty trivial compared to everything else um, let me see there you go you basically have to add a new annotation to the parser here and in order to do that you just have to define the new annotation here it's a bunch of annotations they are ordered so that it's easy to add a new one and remove a new one and then ignore the massive amount of regular expressions here 
as far as regular expressions go, these are very well documented and very well explained. Um, so actually they're not so terrible. But basically all of this parses the doc blocks, the documentation blocks, uh, and find, um, for instance, a property, it will find the class name, the property name, and the various fields, the various annotations there. And then the description and so on and so forth. Right? Signals, actions, sadly, actions are basically useless. Um, these are field documentations. And everything else is basically just a bunch of stuff there to validate the annotation there. So you have to, for every new, um, for every new annotation, you have to add a do validate annotation name. Uh, for instance, let me see. Like, yeah. I, in order to add the free func here, I had to do do validate free func. It's a uh, annotation that takes exactly one option here, one argument, and doesn't do much there. And this is the the parser. This is the thing that will take the documentation block and look for all the annotations in there. After that, since we want to have the free function and the copy function inside the uh, the abstract syntax tree that describes the record functions, the record types, then we go and we find the record class, which is a compound type and then has additional fields and we add the copy function here and the free function here. And the default is none and none because not every single um, struct requires a copy function, a free function. And then what we have to do is we go inside the writer here that generates the XML out of the abstract syntax tree. And then we find write record. And if there is a copy function and a free function, then we dump them inside the XML. We also need to modify the parser. As I said, we have the XML, uh, we generate the XML, but we also have to parse the XML in other, in other places. So we not only have to write the code to generate the XML, but also to parse the XML. So whenever we have to parse a record field, we look for the copy function and free function XML attributes, and we add them here, and then we reference them inside the struct. That's it. There is a missing piece. There is a missing step. So how do we go from the annotation data into the abstract syntax tree? Uh, for that, there are a couple of passes there. One is the main transform, the transformation pass. This is uh, a uh, more complex bit of the um, of the introspection scanner. So the introspection scanner has to take the abstract syntax tree that was generated from parsing the C declarations and then parsing the um, doc blocks and then parsing the uh, the runtime information gathered from the type system itself and then has to basically just run through it for consistency. So all the types have T1, 
the actual type name and the C type, where, wherever that's possible, uh, if a symbol is introspectable or not, and so on and so forth. So in order to do that, whenever we are traversing the abstract syntax tree and we find like uh, one of the types here, uh, the, the entire abstract syntax tree is a tree. So the, the idea is that you can traverse it from the, the topmost element down um, and look at all the uh, all the types there. So whenever we find, uh, uh, where are you? When I find a record or a union, uh, we get the annotation for that type and we look for the copy function annotation and we find it, we take that information and we put it inside the node here. And that's it. This is how you take the information, the metadata inside the annotations and you put it inside the abstract syntax tree. Um, the introspectable, the transformation pass and the introspectable passes um, are more complicated. They go through the entire tree and do uh, more complex things. Like for instance, um, they apply the heuristics out of the uh, conventions. For instance, if you have a G object, and you have a property called name and the C API will typically have a set name and a get name methods on the, on the object instance. So you don't really have to annotate the property to say, uh, the setter for this property is called set name and the proper, uh, the getter for this property is called get name because we can go through the list of methods for this project, for this object and see, is there a set name of the property or uh, then the setter is that one? Uh, is there a getter for the, this property? Then get name is going to be that. Um, is this property a Boolean property and it's read only? And then also look, instead of looking for get name of the property, look for is name of the property or has name of the property. Uh, <coughs> sorry about that. So all the heuristics for the conventions of G object, uh, are part of the way we transform the, uh, abstract syntax tree from the raw, um, set of C declarations and documentation blocks and annotations into the final XML. Uh, we can also do things like um, this object as a property. Uh, the property name is the same name as the as a method, or as a v function, uh, as a virtual function, or a signal. Um, that cannot be. That cannot be done because in a bunch of cases, uh, like a bunch of language bindings, you cannot have like identical names for different concepts. So if you have your object that has a, a name um, property, you cannot have a name signal, for instance, uh, because the language might have like foo.name and that name could be a string for your property, but could also be a signal definition. So you can do foo name connect. Um, so the introspection scanner should go through that and warn the application, the library developer, Hey, you're actually using the same name for like three different things that are not like equivalent to one another. Um, you might want to rename that before you commit to that API stuff, that API. Um, and that is, uh, one thing that, uh, I actually added a couple of cycles ago because we didn't have that particular validation up until now. And that means that we had a bunch of bugs open against various libraries saying, oh, I cannot actually write a binding for this library because this little bit of metadata is in conflict with another bit of metadata. So 
how do I do this? And usually after that comes the, like the, the gnashing of teeth and, and stuff like that because C developers don't understand that uh, different languages have different rules uh, and the fact that you call like a, a, a completely runtime uh, um, concept like a geobject property with the same name as a signal it's not a problem in C because in one case you do geobject set and in another you call G signal limit it's completely different right but from a language like another language perspective those two like values those two names resolve to completely different values and they are directly accessible um so it's i've had to explain this stuff so many times to C developers they just don't understand uh and the usual recriminations start saying, oh, language bindings, that developers should not be doing this and language binding developers have problems and they should not be imposing this stuff on C developers. And the answer is C developers are wrong. <laughs> C developers don't get to dictate how anybody else works. Um, it's because you're the ones provide, well, we are the ones providing uh, the basic uh, functionality but everything else that is based on top has to be consistent otherwise we might as well like just close shop and go home um which is i i think the message has finally like arrived um on the gtk side we kind of started being less about c convenience and more about language convenience of uh, language binding convenience of course language bindings developers have to cooperate with us but that kind of happened the rust um uh, the rust developers the rust bindings developers have been very helpful because every time we commit something they will come back and say oh no uh, this might be a problem or they will review an api before it before it lands but it's kind of a uh it's kind of something that has to be uh, ingrained into what you're doing. And if you're like me and you worked on language bindings before, like I worked a lot on language bindings uh, around the same time I started working on GTK. And the result is that I have the rules of and the requirements of uh, people writing language bindings in my head and I've always have them I've had them uh, while I was working on GTK so every time I write an API I always think how will this be uh, looking or how will this work when dealing with uh, language binding but not everyone is like that because not everyone has worked on language binding before especially C developers <laughs> have issues with that um yeah let me see so this is the the introspection side of things so the sorry not the introspection side of thing this is the xml side of things uh for some annotations um this is all you need to do so if you want to add an annotation that is only relevant for the xml um that's fine there, there is a lot of the, there are a bunch of uh, annotations that are not transferred from the XML to the binary blob um, data because they don't make sense there. Um, but in some cases, we do need the same information from the XML into the binary data. And in order to do that, you have to go inside GI, GI repository and then modify the parser <laughs> which is a c parser is not a, uh, a python parser and then you have to modify the writer as well so you can write the xml again out of the um out of the binary data and then you also have to modify the blob here for instance if we go in for um the uh, copy and free function 
you go into struct info and for instance you want to get the copy function and you get the copy function name so you have to modify the struct blob which is inside the type lib internal And you have to add a copy function, a free function. Um, the important thing is that, as I said, like ages ago, uh, at this point, all of these binary blob data types are written directly to disk. This means that you cannot break their size. Their size is fixed. So some of them have reserved bits, like for instance, in this case, there are six bits of uh, space reserved, which means we can add six more flags, but it doesn't have any more free space. Uh, it had two free slots, two 32-bit free slots for a copy function, a free function, and I use them. So now we cannot add anything else to the structure blob. Uh, and the same thing for the union blob. Uh, some other types have like a field blob, which is a field in a structure, has a 32-bit integer size uh, slot reserve that is still available. Um, and so on and so forth, like reserve here, the error type blob as an 8-bit of data reserve. And again, you cannot, literally, you cannot add stuff here. Uh, sorry, the struct blob here. You cannot add more stuff. You can only split the reserved field here, the sort of bit field here, uh, for stuff that is like six, six bit wide. Um, after that, it's done sealed you cannot change it you cannot modify it hi roman and hi gacek gacek um but yeah this is the important part the binary blob data is fixed if we uh run out of space we cannot do anything about it we can only create a new type and at that point, we will have to create a new type and fuel the old type and the new type in order to have a compatibility layer on top. Um, because if we added a new field here, the size wouldn't match. And if the size wouldn't match, then the binary data on disk would be useless. So we'd, we'd have to change the name of the file uh, we'd have to install them in another location. Uh, we'd have to do a bunch of other things. We have to break the API of the C library. We have to install it in a separate like prefix and, and so on and so forth. Basically, these, this is the limitation of the current introspection um, binary data. There are reserve slots that we can expand into, but once they are done, it's any future change would require a clean break of the types, uh, which means rebuilding all the introspection data and targeting a new introspection version and, and so on and so forth. And that will only ever happen if we are going to move uh, GeoG introspection inside GLib, um, because that would require that would be a break, uh, a big enough break that uh, would justify this. But otherwise, no. Which is also why it's easier, it's a lot easier to add new introspection, like infer metadata, and save it inside the XML than it is to save it inside the binary blob. Um, and it's easier to modify the introspection scanner uh, to generate the uh, XML file than it is to 
modify the uh, GI repository library. Uh, off the top of my head, I don't head. I don't actually remember how many annotations exist in the XML, but don't exist in the um, in the binary blob. But there are. And yeah. And basically, that's it for this. So adding uh, a new annotation in the doc block. Uh, like in this case, two new annotations for uh, the uh, for a type. It's modify the the parser that parses the documentation blocks, modify the uh, XML parser and the XML writer and the um, AST types to match those. Um, create the pass inside the main transformer so that transforms the that is the 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 validation pass and transforms the abstract syntax tree from like C declarations into C declarations plus the metadata out of the annotations. And then for the uh, J repository side, so the binary blob side, uh, you have to modify the parser again and the write the XML write parser and XML writer again. And then you have to modify the binary blob data structures and add API to access that information. And that's it. Well, that's not entirely it. You also have to add the tests for it. Um, GeoBG introspection comes with regression testing uh, so that we... The regression tests are not just for GeoBG introspection. So they're not just used to validate the fact that we are not fucking up, but also they are installed and they're installed so that the language bindings can use the same information to run their own test suite. So they can verify that their uh, implementation of the introspection data parser or the, the their use of the introspection library, the introspection um, loading library is correct. And that is what the regression testing, uh, the regress here, and the uh, marshalling. Uh, where are you? Uh, uh, not here. Yeah, the marshalling tests are here. Uh, this is also a part of the regression testing, uh, regression test suite. So language bindings can always be assumed to um, be uh, working against the current version of GeoBG introspection. Um, so they can they can check. So if introspection tests, the intro, if GeoBG introspection add some new stuff, and the tests are updated, which they should be, um, I, I usually <laughs> try and and check the merge request for that. Um, then we can also assume that the language bindings will not uh, break for any change, which is kind of important since we, since this project provides the, the source of truth for language bindings, this is kind of important. But yeah. So, yeah, this is kind of a, it's kind of been a deep dive into job introspection, mostly because a lot of people just ask how it works. And it's, asking how it works has two goals. The first one is modifying job introspection to add functionality to it. So new annotations, new metadata for like types and stuff like that. But also a lot of people ask because they want to consume job introspection. And you have two ways to consume job introspection. As I said, you have the XML way. So you load a bunch of XML, uh, create your own abstract syntax tree, and then generate code, documentation, whatever. And the other way is you have a binary blob data that you can load and then you use to trampoline into the C API directly. So the XML is usually consumed by 
um, languages like Rust or um, there are C++ bindings based on job joint inspection. Um, uh, I've seen people use it for C sharp. I've seen you people using it for other languages uh, because that is a one off. Uh, you don't have to call your code, your like, code generator, uh, every time you run the application. You have to call it every time you generate the bindings, for instance. So it's an acceptable cost to load like 25 megabytes of XML in one go. Uh, recursively, probably, uh, and then generate a bunch of code for that. It's perfectly accept acceptable. I mean, it doesn't take a huge amount of time. On my machine, uh, loading the XML for GTK4 recursively, so all the dependencies um, off of a, an uh, SSD and parsing it and generating the regenerating the abstract syntax tree with my um, parser in Python, it takes less, th it takes about three seconds. So it's not a huge amount of time. It's not a huge amount of time. Uh, it's a, uh, it's a perfectly valid trade-off. Uh, if you're doing it like to generate documentation or, uh, to generate, uh, like generate code, uh, generating the, the, uh, GTK C API reference out of the introspection data takes almost a minute, three seconds to load the XML and generating the, the absurd syntax tree in memory is a fraction of that, is like 5% of that time. So it's not even worth optimizing for. The, the issue, of course, of not having to do that every time you launch your Python application uh, is kind of more important. Um, so for that, use the, uh, the introspection binary data. And in order to do that, you have to use GI repository, which is the API that GeoGen introspection provides you to do exactly that. And all the dynamic languages like JavaScript, um, like GJS, uh, PyGobject, or uh, the Perl, bindings for GObject, GLib object introspection, uh, use the introspection binary data. Again, loading that is like almost in instantaneous uh, because A, we asked the kernel to give us the uh, a file descriptor to the memory data, to the memory mapped file. Um, so if it has already been loaded in memory, it's literally instantaneous. Um, oh, wait a second. Oh, nice. 300 followers. Nice. Good, good. Uh, even though I don't stream like as, as much as I used to, <laughs> having more followers is good. Um, but yeah. So it's nearly instantaneous. And then since it's like the, the layout of the file is a dump of like C data structures, like loading it, it's again, instantaneous. The, the entire memory area can be mapped to the structures there. Uh, so it's literally, it doesn't even need parsing. It's literally there. So the time spent uh, to to load the introspection data uh, from the binary files is like ridiculously low. It would be interesting, like like as a as a crack optimization, it would be interesting to have the type lib loaded, like appended to the shared library itself, um, <laughs> as an elf section. Uh, that, that would be an interesting, like, experiment. The main problem is still you need to know what to load. So you will still need a way to say, if I'm loading, if I load GTK4, uh, then I have to map that to a library. 
that information is part of the introspection data. So whenever you do from GI repository import GTK, import GTK uh, in Python, uh, you're telling the Py, the PyG object bindings, uh, okay, look for a GTK-4.0 dot typelib um, file in this well-known location. And if it exists there, that that file exists, then it will load it using GI repository. And inside that file, there is a, a, there is a, a field that says, um, if you want to load the, uh, if you want to call into like um, any symbol uh, inside this uh, in this library, then you have to deal open this library here, uh, which will be like libgtk four dot so, and that equivalent that 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 link doesn't exist if we just put all the metadata, all the introspection data into the, the shared library directly. Because then you would need an ancillary file that says, if you load gtk-4, then you are actually loading libgtk4.so or like gtk4.dll. Um, but that would be kind of interesting. Uh, that would be an interesting, like having a, a, a uh, a way to say, okay, if you're if you're actually loading GTK, you're loading like libgtk 4so then you deal open that and you get the elf section, and then that elf section contains the uh, the uh, the introspection data, and you don't have to do anything else. Uh, and the linker will already have that because. GDK is already loaded, so you don't have to load an ancillary file there. Um, I mean, yeah, it's 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 crack. <laughs> I I wouldn't do, it, but it's an interesting like crack idea. If somebody wants to test it out, have a a, a registry that maps namespace ver and version to a specific shared library, and then loads the shared library and extracts the metadata information out of it. Uh, of course, that only works with Elf. Doesn't work on Windows. So, on Windows, you will still need an ancillary file somewhere. So, trade-offs. I mean, if we, if we want to to uh, if we are if we can accept the trade-off, then that that would be an interesting thing to do. But yeah, the the entirety of G, uh, libgi repository is just load recursively all the metadata in binary form and put in send in in memory, so that um, I can navigate through the uh, list of types and list of objects and list of methods inside an object, and then I can set up all the arguments for this function with the correct type and the correct type information. Um, if I'm writing a language binding, my language binding will have to find a way to turn every single native data type into the corresponding C data type that is equivalent. Um, and then like build all the arguments, the little arguments, and then call this function and trampoline into it. And then out of that, take the out arguments and return values, the return value, and build the native type, and then put them in back into the native flow of my of my program. And that kind of API is common to every single dynamic language. Um, so the code here is pretty generic. Um, everyone just calls into it because it's again pretty generic. But the what language bindings like 
separate language bindings do is aside from the transformation they also do some level of caching so they don't have to reallocate a bunch of stuff and they if you have already a bunch of types you can just um, put them in the in the right place so you don't have to rebuild and reallocate a bunch of memory or retransform a bunch of stuff um, or if you call the same symbol multiple times like for instance you're in a loop and you call it multiple times you don't have to rebuild it every single time. Uh, you only have to change the, the arguments uh, depending on the loop. So there are a bunch of optimizations that go into language bindings. Language bindings are not simple. Um, they require knowledge, not just of introspection, but also not, on, not only knowledge of the language, but also knowledge of the C API and the interfaces there, and also the introspection API. But the, the good part of finding the symbols, finding the, the types, describing the types, describing the structures and stuff like that, it's already abstracted for you and like given to you by the GI repository library, which is why, again, everyone uses it. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Uh, one thing I forgot. Uh, since Geometry Introspection ships the introspection data for Glib and GObject and JO and GModule, um, the version of Geometry Introspection has to match the version of Glib. Uh, it cannot be any other way. So whenever Glib releases a new version, GeoBJ Introspection has to release the same, the, the exact same version, which means that um, you have to update them both at the same time. Well, not at the same time, but you have to update them both. Uh, you cannot run a newer version of GeoBJ Introspection with an older version of Glib. Uh, even though maybe GeoBJ Introspection doesn't use new symbols from Glib because it exposes new symbol from Glib. So whenever you update GeoBJ Introspection, you have to make sure that Glib is updated at the same time. Um, otherwise, bad things will happen. And same thing on the other side. Every time, as I said, every time you want to update the uh, annotations inside Glib, you also have to update GeoBJ Introspection so they match. But it's kind of a requirement for any person that wants to work on GeoBJ Introspection to make sure they have an updated version of Glib um, at their disposal. Okay, so... Um... Uh, so, what I was looking for... The big... Ah, there you go. So, there are a couple of... There are a bunch of merge requests here, open that I really want to land. Um, there are a bunch of additional things, like improvements to the macro parser. Macros are one thing that people should really, really avoid when using, when exposing a, a C API, um, because macros don't exist at the C ABI level, and GeoBJ Introspection describes a C ABI. Um, so macros are completely useless. They are only ever useful for documentation purposes. Um, parsing macros is a pain in the ass. Uh, because the C preprocessor is terrible. And the end result is that sometimes macros don't get parsed correctly. So luckily we got a couple of bug fixes there that I need to review still. Um, this is one thing that I really want to get done for this cycle. 
especially because uh, we started using this pattern more often, even in GTK. The new dialogues uh, that uh, the new dialogues API that landed uh, in the main development branch and will be available in GTK 4.10 are all based on asynchronous um, asynchronous operations and having an annotation that says this function here has to be called at the end of the asynchronous operation that started by this other function here uh, is very powerful, especially for documentation purposes, but also for language bindings that uh, have the ability to expose that um, asynchronous operation as part of their uh, overall um, language. Uh, some languages have native concepts of uh, async await, uh, Python, Rust, and, and other languages, JavaScript. So the overall idea of being able to say, this function here is an asynchronous function, and the, um, the, the function that completes this asynchronous function is called dash uh, underscore finish, um, but not always. <laughs> it's not always the case. Sometimes the function is called underscore async, and the uh, the finish is underscore finish. Sometimes the underscore async doesn't exist because the function is always asynchronous. So there's no point in having uh, underscore async version. Uh, the And sometimes it's called, <laughs> the, the, the synchronous version exists and it's called underscore sync. So it, it's kind of messy that way. So uh, this one was the result of uh, Google Summer of Code, it wasn't completed because it's kind of a complex uh, piece of machinery. So uh, sometimes um, sometimes Summer of Code students or outreach students, are, uh, outreach interns are perfectly fine uh, working on a complex piece of machinery. Sometimes the complex piece of machinery requires more than like six months, uh, not even that, like four months of work. Um, on top of academic, uh, like academic work, for instance, for in the case of the summer of code. Um, so the end result is not everything gets completed. Uh, in this case, it was started, and uh, I think it's um, it's a good start. It's not complete because it's missing the uh, information inside the uh, type lib data. And it's not complete on the introspection, uh, the XML side either, but that one is a lot more close to what um, what the end result would be. So the overall idea is, is exactly that, having annotations that says uh, this is a synchronous, uh, a synchronous function and this is uh, the, the finish function for that asynchronous one. And also have some heuristic mechanism that says if there is a function that is called underscore finish, uh, then that is the finish for the function that is the same name minus the underscore finish. Um, so we can avoid the annotation entirely. Um, but yeah, so this is another thing that I really want to work on, rebase and uh, merge for the next cycle because it will be useful. Yeah, and also uh, it's missing regression testing and and some other thing, some other stuff. So there, for a while, job inspection was basically, if not unmaintained, was very low maintenance uh, because people moved on, people contributed to it and then moved on. Language binding developers already have their their played full with their language binding, caring about job inspection sometimes isn't, isn't enough. Um, I, I picked up a little bit of this while I was working on GObject and, and GTK, mostly because I wanted to releases and, and things like that. So the release team would be, um, would be fine with it. And also to update the annotations inside Glib. But um, I've seen more people look into this uh, over the past couple of cycles. So it's, it's 
it's good. It's a good thing. <laughs> um, more people should look into this. More people should help in the language binding side of things uh, for the platform because this is how people interact with it. Uh, it's not C anymore. More people should, uh, even C developers should be aware of this stuff and should probably contribute <laughs> to it. Um, especially because, as I said, I really want um, I really want this code to land into G object into inside the Gilly uh, project um, sooner rather than later. Uh, we were talking about doing this 2011, like 10 plus years ago. Um, then we had to stop because again, not many people were working it. And then it's gotten to the point where it's better if we start like figuring this shit out. Otherwise, we're going to get stuck and we're already kind of stuck with GObject. We cannot add new functionality in some cases because of uh, API stability concerns. Um, bumping the API of GObject, bumping the API version of GObject is going to be a bloodbath. Uh, we did that for LibSoup and it was two entire cycles of pain and misery and that is just libsoup libsoup is the http library it doesn't do anything other than that uh, it doesn't do anything special or specific apart from connecting to http services and getting and uh, getting data and um, like posting data and Bumping the API of that library was already an exercise in pain for anybody that was maintaining libraries, maintaining applications, uh, the release, the GNOME release team, distributors. I don't even want to think about what bumping the version of GObject would look like. It would be. <laughs> It would be terrifying. Like we'd have to bump every single library that depends on GObject, and there are many. Every single application we'd have to build everything twice because not everything can bump their version. Uh, everything stuff that is built with GObject two would need to have a secondary build with GObject three. You could not mix the two because you cannot have two symbols inside the same um, the same process space. Uh, even you can have two types with the same name unless we start add versioning to our types. It, it would be it would be terrifying just to think about it. And job introspection is kind of in a similar boat. because then every single language binding will have to update the version of GeoBJ introspection and then would need to basically just exist in in suspend in suspension between like two different versions of the stack. Uh, it would be it would be a mess. So we'll have to we'll have to think long and hard about this. Anyway, I think it's time for me to wrap this up uh, because it's two hours and a half. I haven't been streaming in a month and change, probably a month and a half. Uh, so I don't want to do like a, a, a seven hour stream. <laughs> um, but yeah, the I've, I've seen a shout out from the Pigeon developers um, the, the pigeon developers have been porting, uh, the, <sighs> how do I describe pigeon? Pigeon, like, is, pigeon has been for like two decades now. It's, it's, it's a thing. Um, for the people who have never heard of it, um, uh, congratulations, you must be very young. And, uh, it's an uh, instant messaging client uh, that has multiple protocols and 
um, it's written using GTK, and now the uh, Pigeon developers are porting it to GTK4, and it's uh, very interesting. And uh, one of their developers streams the process a bunch of times uh, during the week. Uh, so the uh, uh, I got a shout out from from them uh, because they were having a bug, <laughs> they were having a problem, and uh, I wasn't online. Sadly, uh, we are on completely different um, the side of the of the planet, uh, so uh, I I don't get to watch their stream, but I sometimes watch their um, their vod on on Twitch. So let me. Let me see if I can get their name correct. But yeah, um, yeah, it's uh, it was great. Uh, I've I've seen them their their stream. It's it's very interesting. If you want to get down into the nitty gritty of porting a very complex, very old, and very uh. I mean, old in the sense that it has the project has a ton of history behind it. Um, a, a very complex application uh, to GTK4 and Libadwaita, then uh, go and, and watch their stream. They're, they're pretty interesting. Um, so, yeah. Uh, let me see. If I can get no, I don't have anybody. I don't have anybody for raiding, so um, I think I'll I'll just end the stream here. Uh, thank you very much for uh, following along. I hope I didn't bore everyone uh, with the history of the, the object inspection, um, but I do hope that uh, I shed some light on this on this particular topic. Uh, I'm I'm happy to do other streams on this, uh, especially more like more hands-on in terms of um, like language binding development. Even though I haven't been writing language bindings for a while now, um, the I I have a I have a, a very <laughs> I have a very bad idea. <laughs> uh, I might end up doing this on stream because uh, I'm evil like that. But um, yeah, writing the the pearl bindings for GTA Four and Libadwaita that would be that would be hilarious. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll probably do that. I might actually do that uh, next stream, and uh, probably I'll try to stream tomorrow as well because. It's a weekend. Uh, it's a weekend, and if I if I'm not working, then I can I can stream. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, again, thanks very much for everyone here. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, because I I managed to upload the vod, then uh, why not follow me on Twitch? Twitch.tv/slash Um I will try to stream on the weekends from now on uh, because I'm. I'm busy during the week, um, but otherwise uh, I'm happy to do that during during the weekend. Um, yeah. Otherwise, if you just if you missed a bunch of of the stream uh, because you joined late, or uh, then go on my YouTube channel, uh, YouTube.com/slash at Ebasi because now they changed the YouTube has changed the way uh, you can get to a, a YouTube channel. Uh, but yeah, you can you can join me there uh, and watch the vods. Um, I again I recommend the G Object Deep Dive uh, three parter um, because it if you are not familiar with how G Object works, that should give you all the information necessary for uh, to understand how it how it's done how it how it works internally and how to use it from your own code base. Uh, otherwise, I'll. Just I just recommend watching my my videos on Amberall and on documentation writing and probably in the next streams like next weekend I'll try to do what um, the other topics that have been uh, voted on uh, social media like uh, writing uh, 
GTK tutorials or um, looking at improving the GTK build builder um, like situation instead of having an XML parser, do something else. You know, uh, maybe improve the the life of people writing additional grammars uh, for describing UIs instead of using XML. Uh, in any case, again, thank you very much for watching. Um, see you next time and have fun with Jobject and Gnome and GTK. Uh, and yeah, have a nice rest of the weekend and watch my uh, Mastodon and watch my Twitter account if that still exists in the near future uh, for when I I go online for, for a stream or follow me on Twitch here. Um, you will get notified every time I start streaming. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you all for watching and see you next time. Bye.